Hi everyone, the following video is a recording from our Long Exposure Photography Workshop hosted by Long Exposure Masters Kim Henry and Eric Parr. This session was held in the Meta Jungle Discord on April 25th, and we want to thank Kim and Eric for providing the Meta Jungle community the opportunity to learn more about long exposure photography, including the topics an intro into outdoor light painting, blue hour versus the moon versus the Milky Way versus late night shooting featuring the sky in Milky Way, equipment prep and location settings, as well as how to get the perfect color straight from the camera using tube lighting, white balance, and camera settings. We hope you find this incredible workshop helpful, so let's get into it. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Long Exposure Workshop at Meta Jungle. Thanks for being part of this. Kim, do you have something to say? Um, nothing. <laughs> Nothing except the fact that we're super excited to share what we do with you. And uh, as you were saying, don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, yeah, let's get started. All right. So this is our presentation. And what we're going to cover today is a small recap about tube light painting, the gear we're using, the different settings, uh, some additional information about the blue hour, astrophotography, how we compose our images, and the colors, how to get super great colors out of your long exposure images. So, all right. So how we get started with this, how, how, uh, that, how we came up uh, with this, like, it's been so long for us. Uh, we started doing light painting in 2012, so it's been uh, 10 years now. But it took a while before we figured out about how to do it outdoors. Um, but we've been doing that kind of shots, studio light painting for super long. We enjoy working in the studio. We have uh, this black studio here, super big, where we can do that kind of shots. But we love to travel also. So this is um, more typical of our outdoors work, where Kim is uh, dancing and I'm taking pictures sometimes from very far away. As you can see on this picture, I'm using a 400 millimeter lens. But we wanted to mix both techniques, the, the light painting and the outdoors work, and we came up with this. So this is kind of a mix of uh, dance photography, long exposure, uh, but Kim is a dancer, but she's not dancing in this shot. She's standing still, and I am dancing with my light behind her. A few recap of the images that we that we created over the years. So this image was done actually the first night we experiment with that uh, long tube. That was our new tool that we found uh, in California in 2015. And that was actually the tipping point that allowed us to mix both um, as, as Eric said earlier. So this is another one moving on in 2016 in Indonesia, Bolivia in 2017, Morocco, California again, near home, and in Montreal. Yeah, so this one is one of the most recent shots that we did just a few months ago in the snow. This is super close from where we live. And if you're new to this, uh, it might look like it's all made in uh, Photoshop, but actually it is real. This is an actual side view of me behind Kim with my tube. So on purpose, I, I put another camera on the side so I can demonstrate how it looks like if you're not uh, the, the main camera. So I'm, I'm uh, always sideways so I get more hidden behind Kim. I do my typical circle while Kim is standing still. And that tube itself is simply, simply a flashlight inside a plastic tube. So the tube itself is not making any light, but we put a flashlight inside of it. And that's how we, we came up with this. Again, here is the front view to so the end result on the top. And the side view 
So we can see the camera on the right side of the image. And again, I'm behind Kim with my tube. On this one, we used a, a birthday sparkler on top of the tube because it was your birthday? Yeah. No? Okay. Another front view and side view. And the gear that we're using for this is pretty simple. The camera can be uh, any DSLR, more or less, uh, even a smartphone. Some people are doing this kind of work for the smartphone. It works. Prefer to use a, uh, a DSLR or more or less because it's just more precise, more more fluid with the uh, with the triggering. A wireless remote. It looks like. This right here. So this is a young new, and I have uh, all of the links for these uh, these things somewhere on the on website. Um, we're using a flashlight, so between fifty and two thousand lumens. So this one is even bright. I think it's two thousand two hundred. Yeah. So bright. You can almost cook an egg with that. Yeah, it, it's so warm. Do you have the uh, on the fingers? Oh yeah. <laughs> So you two that, that we received today, so this is coming so hot that it's just now to, uh, it's not possible for me to, to work with this other tool. So this is a hollow square, it's another tool different from the tube. When it gets so hot in here, when I press that, I need a silicone finger to make, to make it uh, possible for me to hold it. We can do that another time. Get that? Bigger brand. <laughs> so silicone finger, so I don't burn myself. So all of that, just to say that some of the flashlights are super bright, and this is how we're able to shoot during the blue hour. With a powerful flashlight, we can start working earlier during the night. And then um, strobe mode on the flashlight. Uh, this is helping to, uh, to get some stripes in the tube. And the tubes, the caps, the feather, a bunch of things that we're going to show you later on. On this slide, we're showing you everything that we're using and how we place ourselves for the actual shot. So you can see where I am behind him. I'm holding one wireless uh, remote. There's another one on the camera itself. So we'll see the camera, the tripod. Uh, Kim, she's standing there, and my light painting too. About the tubes that, themselves, so it looks like looks like this. Okay, so it's a plastic tube, and we do have a store where you can uh, where you can get those tubes. But we also teach how you can make your own, so you don't have to buy anything from us. It's quite easy, especially if you live in Canada or USA, super easy because you can find the base material, the, uh, the plastic tube itself at Home Depot for just a few bucks, so you can make your own. I'm not going to do that. You should. Mm. So yeah, the more we, we used to do every uh, tool we were using to create light by hand, like a lot of arts and crafts and trials and errors, but since we've been doing this for a few years, um, like the requirements that we want for the tools are more and more specific. So that's why we decided to build them and also like to sell them so people can use everything we use instead of having to start from scratch. I might use this as a dimmer at some point. Ah. <laughs> so yeah, it's a lot of experimenting always uh we're always trying to find new ways to uh create different textures colors and yeah a lot of a lot of fun okay. i don't know if, if it's it has been clear so far that we're doing long exposure using a light so <laughs> just to make sure <laughs> can you guys react with a thumb up or it, uh, on this course so we can see that we're not alone yeah is it clear? <laughs> so whether we work indoors or outdoors, um, we've been seeing this for years. The only source of light is the one in Eric's hand. So from the first shot, like the, the pink one that you saw at the beginning of, uh, of our uh, demo, or 
all those outdoor light painting shots, the only source of light, like I'll say artificial light, is the one we're using. So we're not using any other source of light except the one we're crafting by ourselves. Yeah. But what are the camera settings to do this? Um, it's not the simplest thing. Uh, we do have a recipe and that table is pretty much the best one we have uh, that shows the, the camera settings that we're using. But it's always a matter of balancing the camera settings and the, the brightness of the flashlight. Okay, so uh, what I keep saying is expose for the background first. Because most people, most of you already know how to um, to do a landscape shot, a landscape photography. So what you're going to add on this is the um, the setting for the, the flashlight itself. So if let's say uh, you're shooting at f11 ISO 100, you're gonna need a very bright flashlight because your camera settings are going to be very dim. So that's going to be at the beginning of the blue hour. So this chart is showing you the progression of the of the settings uh, from the beginning of the blue hour to very late at night when we're shooting with the stars in the Milky Way. You'll find that um, that chart on on our website. The link is written uh, right below, so you can study this chart. It's pretty accurate. We're, we're using it uh, even for for ourselves. It works great uh, during the the blue hour because the settings are changing super quickly. But if you're shooting with, with the moon or like uh, we said, like we did in the, in the winter with the snow in the forest, the settings are not changing that much. So it's really the blue hour that is a bit more tricky. Um, we might come back to the, uh, this uh, chart later on, but just to, just to make it a bit more simple, the blue hour, so these three shots have been uh, made during the, the blue hour. And it's always about um, ISO between 100 and 400 um, and changes like quickly do, when the, the sun is uh, spreading out. And then you have to adjust the, bright, the, brightness, the brightness of your flashlight. But the more you do it, the easier it gets. And it's the, the most tricky moment of the day to do uh, to light painting. But once you figure this out, it's easier to, to work la later with the stars and, and the moon. Exactly, because during that period of time, uh, the, the light is changing very fast. I don't know if, um, yeah, you guys, there, I see a lot of faces that we know. So you probably already shoot landscape during the blue hour and you know how quick the, the sky changes. So that's the most challenging and probably exciting part um, part of the, the day to create during. Um, and just to make sure the blue hour, when we talk about the blue hour, it's like after, you know, the golden hour, once uh, the sun is below the horizon until we, we see like the few uh, first stars in the sky. More. Yeah. So, so when the, the sun goes below the horizon, it's still a bit too early. There, there are no flashlights that are powerful enough to, to do that. Uh, but just wait a few minutes and then you're good to go. So probably like 10 minutes after the... Yeah. The so, and, and for us, actually, during our workflow, uh, when it's too bright, it's a good moment to choose the composition and test things out. So when once the, the lighting is really good and optimal, we're already good to go. Okay, so I have a bunch of examples of shots that we did during the blue hour. One, two... Three and four. Oh, let's go full screen on this. Four, three, two, and one. All right. And then let's go to astrophotography. So it took us a while to figure that out, but it's actually simpler than working during the blue hour because things are not as things are not going as fast. The stars are not moving uh, super fast. The, the, the settings are the same for the whole night, except you, if the moon is rising, then it's a bit different. But if you're just shooting with the stars of the Milky Way, it's always the same. It's ISO 3200, uh, F1.8, and about eight second exposure time. And now, if some of you already do uh, astrophotography, maybe you're thinking, well, 
well, that's a very short exposure time for uh, an astral shot. But we have to keep in mind that we have um, a subject that has to remain still the whole duration time. So I could not be able to stay still for 30 plus seconds. That would be impossible. <laughs> so um, if we want to have a sharp subject, uh, we need to short to make it as short as possible um, to optimize uh, the result. Yeah. And just to uh, go a bit uh, more in depth with this, the circle that you see uh, on this image is not eight seconds. The exposure is eight seconds, but I'm doing the circle in two seconds only. So Kim is lit up only for the two first seconds. And then we have six more seconds remaining where I'm either going to dig a hole in the sand to hide myself or just run away to, to disappear. But then why is it, why does it matter that much that we keep the exposure short? Could, could we just run for 30 seconds if I turn off the light? Yes and no. Um, the thing is that Kim, it might move a little bit, okay? So, so at some point, we're going to see some stars through our body because it's just not possible to stay as still during 30 seconds. So it would work, but it's just not ideal. Except in very specific cases, you have this one, yeah, right here. So if you're shooting against a, a black wall or anything that is gonna be uh, pitch black, it's much easier. And then you can go for 30 seconds because there's nothing behind the subject. But if there's something like stars, it's very hard to do more than eight seconds. And believe me, we tried. <laughs> so many times. And yeah, we found out that eight seconds is pretty much the, the sweet spot for this. Uh, any questions so far? Not so far, so but if anyone has any, just type them in the chat or let me know. Great. So on this one here, we're mixing the Milky Way and the moon. So it's not a full moon, otherwise it wouldn't be possible. So it was probably just a quarter of mm -hmm. the, the moon. And also in the astrophotography part, uh, on this one here, uh, we see that the stars are very big. And usually when you do astrophotography, you want to have the stars in focus. So you're going to fine tune your focus for the stars. But in my case, I prefer to have very big stars. So uh, sometimes, like I'm in this image, I'm going to be a bit closer to Kim and with a um, an aperture of f1.4. So everything behind Kim is really out of focus, including the stars. So it's really on purpose that I'm doing this. And you see also the, the stars are getting super colorful. So this is all made in camera. I don't, I'm not even sure why the, the stars are that colorful, but it's a bonus of uh, shooting at f1.4 uh, using uh, this technique. Can you go back to the first one? Um, this one. Yeah. So to answer your question, Shadow, um, yes, exactly. So the, the, the total exposure is eight seconds, but then the light, like the circle is made during like two seconds. And then Eric turns off the light, he hides. I stay there for six more seconds. So it's eight seconds total. Does that make sense? And to be a bit more specific on this, so I have my flashlight and my tube here, and I'm using this remote here. So it makes it easier for me to turn on and off the light on the fly. So I do my circle in two seconds. And then I, I release the button. And this remote switch here is not made for light painting. This is uh, to mount on a gun. Okay, so this is for deer hunting, not mm -hmm. for art, but we've been using this uh, for, for a very long time. So most of the technical flashlight can work with this kind of, uh, of remote. And just to make sure, like, as Eric was saying earlier, it's a question of balance. So balancing the settings that are needed for the background, in this case, uh, the Milky Way, and the power of the flashlight. Let's say he, we would have used a less powerful flashlight. It means that he would have 
if we want to keep the same settings, the movement needs to be slower. And if the movement is slower, let's say six seconds for the, or, or even like eight seconds, super like slow uh, motion of light, um, it is possible, but then it means that uh, your movement will be probably less precise and it's gonna be visible in the shape. It's, because it's really hard to be like precise and, and stable and steady if you're moving slowly, um, but that's also an option. Yeah, I got this thing about not having my work that looks like it's made by hand, okay? So I avoid any hesitation, something that you would guess that it's made by hand. I want a really clean shape, a beautiful circle, a beautiful side shape around him. And this is why people are always saying that it's made in Photoshop. Uh, no, it's just that when you're moving fast, it's easier to make something very smooth, especially the circle. So if I try to do a circle in 13 seconds, my circle is going to be super wobbly and with hesitation. So two seconds is pretty much the, mm -hmm. the sweet spot for, for my circle. Three seconds within a longer exposure if you're shooting with the stars and the Milky Way. All right. We're good? We're good. Okay. So next, the moon is quite easy. Uh, it's, it's a good uh, starting point. If you can have a full moon night, and it's your first time going out with the tubes, it's perfect because the settings are not going to change for a long time. So you can practice, uh, get used to, to the right settings and just have fun with this. And you're actually going to see things that you didn't even know that existed. So first image, top uh, left corner, not the sun. We cannot do these things with the sun, it's the moon. So the moon setting over uh, a lake or a salt pass as we, as we can see here, it's so unique. Uh, Never seen something like this before. Starting to go out at two a.m. to uh, to shoot with the with the moon. So the settings uh, for for these shots are usually about ISO eight hundred f two point eight four seconds and two hundred lumens on the flash on the flashlight itself. And as you can imagine, like in all of these shots, we put the moon in the framing, and, and that's uh, like in the composition, and that's a really important key because. Um, if we would have done the opposite, then you can probably guess that the moon would have light me up. Uh, so it would have been as if we would use a, you know, an, another source of light in front of the subject. And also like it, it would have cast uh, shadows, shadows uh, on the tripod. So yeah, it's, it's easier if you put the moon in the frame. So wide angle lens all the time. So probably, uh, on all of these shots, I am at 14 millimeters. But as you're uh, on, on at f2.8, you don't need a very fancy lens. Any 14 millimeter can, can do that. Super wide angle, put the moon in the frame. Yeah. So these are all either uh, moon set or uh, moon rises. All right. Let's talk about the composition now. Did you notice that on so many of our images, on purpose, we're going to put Kim about at waist level with the, the mountain behind her. It's create like multiple uh, layers of depth and it adds a lot uh, for, for this kind of shot. So it's something to keep in mind when you're doing location scouting because if you go during the day and you see some hills behind, it might be green, might be uh, brown, but at night it's going to be black and it's going to create a beautiful delimitation on, on your images. So just try to put that about at the waist level and super beautiful. And then you get the um, uh, the sky also uh, in the image. So, so it's great to have like that foreground, that layer of uh, hills, and then the clouds of the sky behind everything. Yeah, exactly. So it creates uh, many uh, different depths in the image. And then sometimes I'm going to add a twirl. And what's cool about the twirl is that you're not going to light up your subject. So it's just adding more like longer shape to fill up the empty space on your images. Uh, make sure you go on the right side. I've seen many images where people are going on the other side and then creates a weird composition. So always think about filling the empty space with your twirl. 
And then uh, so talking about the composition, wrapping your subject using the landscape. So in these three examples, I'm using either the trees, some uh, formation on the on the lake, and then uh, salt flats, uh, salt formation to put Kim inside one of those uh, salty thing. <laughs> Yeah, so everything you already know and use uh, when you're doing landscape photography, like using the foreground, uh, using leading lines, um, like all of these are transferable knowledge and skills, but then we add up the light painting and the subject. So the human subject and the shape of the light. So it's kind of, it complexifies uh, the composition. Um, it does because we like to have fun. <laughs> we don't like to just stay behind the camera, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, actually, it's, it's not uh, part of this, but it, it really changed my life to start going behind Kim instead of staying behind the camera. It's just so much more fun, and I feel like I'm I'm part of the images. So I'm triggering using uh, my my wireless trigger, but I'm I'm really be behind Kim shaping the light so there's something very enjoyable about about doing this and very challenging also because as you can guess when we're shooting uh, either in, in the snow or in sand dunes i cannot do a straight line going from the camera to kim i have to make a whole loop all around running to go change the settings do another set of uh, light painting shots be behind her so keeping us in shape very happy yeah exactly so we it's it's really like as you're saying, like it, being part of the picture and crafting the image, uh, enhancing the landscape with the light. The composition with the with the clouds, uh, uh, that's something that is happening so many times. Like you, you do location scouting, it looks good with one angle, but then the night comes and the clouds are just changing everything. So you have to adjust and compose with the clouds. So these are moving quite fast sometimes, but we adjust and what's great is that these are unique, impossible to recreate. It's, it was a one shot deal. We'll never have the, these clouds ever again. Um, so when it's cloudy, I'm going to focus more about uh, comp the composition with the clouds themselves and not, not too much about the, um, the other things that are in, in the way. So th this is the same here. So I used the opening in the clouds with the kind of uh, clouds going thicker on the right side. I thought it was the, the, the best way to do it for this one. And it helps that we have reflection, of course. Yeah, exactly. And just to mention, if the subject on this image would have looked on the other side, then I don't know if you can imagine it, but it would have feel uh, not well balanced. So this is also like uh, something to, think about when we uh, create the composition. And then sometimes I'm using a longer focal length. On most of the images that we, we presented so far, I uh, was shot with either 14 millimeters, 16, 24, or 35, but sometimes it's just not working because uh, we have a small village on one side or things that are in the way. And when I feel stuck, I go at 85 millimeters. So I always have a longer focal length with me. And these three images have been made with that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And then the colors. So is it real? As you probably guessed by now, yes, it's all a uh, real made in camera. And we get these uh, crazy colors by using the right tool, the right uh, settings, the right white balance. It's a mix of all of those. And this specific one is a very recent picture. It's been made uh, last uh, fall, I think, uh, near Montreal. And because our our um, tools are getting better also, and we have uh, better colors. And so this one is called the sugar tube. And as you can see, yeah. It's, yeah, we can see some colors. You see some colors. So it's holographic material inside of the tube. And this is what's creating the, the colors in the light painting shape. And of course, on the water, it's just magical, uh, as you can see in this one. 
but it works uh, only during the blue hour. I wouldn't do that with the with the stars uh, later at night. I think it would be just too much. Uh, I don't think that we could fit that with the Milky Way. Maybe I never try. I just yeah. I'm just not my <laughs> style, but maybe at some point. But my point here is that if you're using the right uh, the right color of, the, of your tube. Uh, with the right white balance, and this one was probably around 4,200 Kelvin. Works super well for, for this shot. But my typical color for the blower is the orange too. So you've seen uh, so many of my images. This is the one I've been using since pretty much the, the beginning. It's a no-brainer. It's, it's just a perfect recipe when... Uh, getting about halfway during the blue hour when it's really blue uh, with the white bands at about 4,800 uh, Kelvin. That's just perfect. And it's, again, very simple, uh, milky, milky white tube, similar to the one I have in my hands right here. So very orange. <laughs> I'm getting at the end already. I think we're talking fast. <laughs> and just a quick bonus. Uh, we're using the same uh, sugar tube in the studio. This is uh, in a knee not too long ago uh, in the studio right here uh, using 176 cameras. So I'm currently holding my sugar light painting tube. And we have uh, yeah, the uh, the end result not exactly for this one, but very similar. Uh, is it playing? Yeah. So very similar to the work we do outdoors, but in studio it's uh, it's a bit different because we don't have a background, so we aim to have a pitch black uh, background, and then I can uh, move all around Kim with my tools. And what you see on the floor is the is the opening of my so I was pointing down down at the floor. That's what that's what created these uh, these lights. And also, like because of uh, the three sixty uh, angle of that specific shot, you can you can really see all the dip, like uh, the colorful um, texture that that comes from the the tube itself, which is the same that we showed uh, just a minute ago. So that's it for this uh, presentation. We went quite fast, so yeah, it's a it's a lot of uh, a lot of information, and we can talk in depth and in details for hours. Um, but yeah, if you have any question specific things that you would like to know, um, I think now is a good moment because we have time, and yeah. <laughs> If you have questions, comments. Hey, Russell, face. Um, while people are um, are typing their questions, maybe. Um, yeah, we we didn't go in details about like the extra things we use. Uh, on top of the tubes and stuff like that, but uh, like as you can see on the picture, Eric is holding uh, on the on top of the tube. Eric is holding on that picture right there. I don't know if you can see. There's a little thing um, at the edge, at the outer edge of the tube, and it's a it's a feather. So we create we use different arts and crafts. Uh, ideas like feathers or birthday sparklers to create extra um, texture and colors at the edge of, uh, of the tube. So, it, so it's really endless. Um, and yeah, yeah, exactly. So we can always find different, uh, different ways to add very like specific details uh, in light. So we have that is saying that piece felt like it 
360 volumetric image. Do you want to explain the 360? Mm -hmm. So volumetric capture is um, the act of using multiple cameras to film a subject to, to then have a 3D um, animation, like a real capture of a subject. Um, that's a technology that I don't know. I do photogrammetry here, which is very similar to the bullet time. Same cameras, same uh, same software. But when you're looking at our uh, 360 work, so okay. this here, it's not photogrammetry, it's not volumetric capture. This is only long exposure images put one after the other to create the MP4. So it's it's quite simple, actually. I mean, it's complicated to put all of these cameras together, uh, but the post-processing, it's simply what it is. It's what we captured, as opposed to photogrammetry when we're scanning uh, humans. It's more technical, and we're going to uh, have a very clean subject with no, uh, no light painting at all. It's just about having, like, a uh, perfectly diffused light on the subject. And then we can start from this base subject to put it inside a 3D environment to uh, to apply some some lights or some or to put them in different uh, 3D scenes. Uh, very similar uh, capture, but very different output for, for the two. And it's the same same technique, same long exposure technique um, that we use, be it with one camera with a hundred like 176 or outdoors it's always this always the same principle always the same way of uh, the same idea of crafting the light by hand to um, light up the subject and also like create a visible trace of light that will be part of the image great what's next kim where are we going uh wow Spain. 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 Living in uh, one month, and that's a picture over there. It's actually made uh, exactly where we're going. Going to the Photopills camp. Uh, this is something we do every year where we teach this technique. But Photopills, it's uh, it's actually an app that we're using to uh, to do uh, to know more about uh, when when and where the Milky Way is going to be located in our shots. Yeah. And she's the expert about that. I'm. I'm very clueless about uh, about the photo biz, but she's uh, getting good. So this is how you plan, uh, like when to go to a specific place. Exactly. Yeah. So we use it to know like the the phases of the moon, uh, the, the the exact time of the the blue hour, like the exact twilight moment that we need. Um, so it's a very useful tool for um, any landscape photographer, astrophotographer that we love. So is there any more questions? Yeah, and if you'd like to take, the, take your mic and yeah. talk to us, it's a good moment. We would love to talk to you or with you. I just wanted what's to last, say I've enjoyed uh, the what's so Mia's much. What's Mia's favorite food? Oh. <laughs> Salmon? Salmon? No, chicken. She loves chicken. Oh, chicken. <laughs> what? Chicken flavored cat food? <laughs> and also, like, um, We've been teaching since the beginning, like we've been teaching what we do and what we discover as we discover it um, since 2014, I guess, or yeah, mm -hmm. at least. Yeah. Um, so if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, as you can see on the, there you go. We have information uh, on tubestories.tv, we have over 200 videos um, explaining the technique, showing some example. Um, and we have a Facebook group where we everybody share what they learn, what they discover, what they know with each other. So the, the technique itself can grow and evolve much faster because everyone uh, is 
getting their input. Going to show uh, the website. Not showing. We have a question here. Uh, Shabby is asking, can you tell us a bit about your uh, post workflow? So uh, I'm assuming your question is about the um, landscape tube light painting post processing. Yeah, about the post processing, I don't talk too much about that because there isn't much to say. Um, and everything has been said uh, already by uh, astrophotographers, I think. So I don't want to repeat uh, what's already out there. But uh, basically, for uh, the Milky Way, I'm going to look at uh, Michael Shane Blum tutorials about how to edit the, the Milky Way. But I'm trying to get as close as possible to a uh, good shot out of the camera. Not because I don't know Photoshop. I've been doing Photoshop for way longer than, than photography. Uh, and I'm all okay with doing composites. And I've been doing a lot of composites, actually. My first two light painting shot with the Milky Way were composites uh, back in 2015, I think. But the more, the more we've been teaching about that and the closer I've been getting to have an image that has been made straight out of the camera. And one of the reasons is that we're teaching and we're filming the process. So if I'm filming from one camera and then I transition to the final image and it looks too different, something feels wrong to me. And also the, the older I get and the less time I want to spend on the computer. So I want to be more outdoors. And it just feels so satisfying when you're taking a shot and it's super good right on the uh, monitor of your camera. So what I'm going to do is to post-process these images is just to bring them in uh, Adobe Camera Raw. I don't use Lightroom that much. I play a bit with the sliders and uh, bring that to Photoshop. I'm going to do a bit of color grading, remove the things that are unwanted. Uh, if I forgot to... Uh... Yeah, if, if something is visible that we didn't see because we were in a rush or like... A... Yeah. 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 I'm saying that, but I've, I've been doing post processing like never before for the winter shots. It's the, the winter series that we uh, released uh, a few weeks ago. And the reason is that it's harder in the snow to have something clean. Uh, so I'm uh, going back to uh, one specific image. Getting there. All right, so this one here took me about probably six hours to edit, and usually it takes me just uh, between five and 15 minutes, but it was super messy, footprints everywhere in the, in the background because people walked uh, on the slope, um, color grading, just making everything more perfect. It's, it's so hard in the snow because the, um, the final alignment might be a bit different from what we uh, so in the beginning, so sometimes I'm, I'm going to have some uh, places where we walk in the in the background. Mm -hmm. So I have to remove all of that. And good thing I, I learned about these things a while ago because it's 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 a lot of work, but it's worth it in the end because uh, the final result is quite clean. Yeah, exactly. Because for for these locations, the margin of error for composition is very slim to none. Uh, because as you said, like if the footprint are not directly aligned be behind like the the subject, um, it's visible. So. Yeah, and especially on this one, as it's going up behind exactly. you, there's nowhere to to hide it. You make footprints, but footprints were already visible from people that walked there previously. Yeah, right, right before. But we like to keep it simple, as simple as possible. Yeah. Uh, can. The... Can you can you say that again? I don't know. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> I'm not sure but... who that was, but uh, I had a question. What's your favorite image for both of you? I think it's not even there. No, I, I didn't include it in there, but it's very similar to um, one that is 
bit further down. I, actually, I, I'll come back to that, but as we were talking about the process, the post processing, uh, I forgot to mention uh, that in rare, in rare cases, we do composites, as you can guess on this one here, the star trails are not in a, are not made in a single export. It's just not possible. So the, the light painting image is one shot created in two seconds only. And then the star trails are a time lapse of 30 minutes that we took at the same spot right after we did this one. So it's a much longer process. Uh, but when the alignment of the stars is great, uh, it's super good. And I think we've been lucky on this one because usually we would look at the at photo pills to figure out the, the direction of the star trails. But on this one, we had to point that direction because of the blue hour. So we've been lucky that the star trails were pointing uh, at the right direction. So that's a composite, of course, but it's two, uh, two frames from the, the same spot. Um, favorite image? Could you wanna... uh, just a, we had a. I'll go back to my favorite image. It gives me more time to think. Um, we have a question. What light did you use for the previous image after the snow one? So... After, the, after the snow. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, can you clarify? Because this, this the snow is the last one in this series. Saying the California one. Oh, okay. Uh, so this one here? Is that the one? We'll explain this one. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, That's a very good question. Yeah, it is. So I'm going to grab it when I start explaining. Oh, sure. So I don't know if somebody would like to guess because um, we always use a tube with a flashlight at the, the base and the one that Eric is holding. So in order to have light only at the outer edge, we made a black tube. A black tube. Okay. So this is a light that emits that is this is a tube that emits no light at all. So I put my flashlight inside of it and you see there's no light on the on the side here. So I use this as the next extension. So if I go on the other side, then I have a smaller tube at the top and I go on strobe like yeah. this. Strobe is blinking. Yeah. So I went behind Kim with this. It's so simple. I feel like I'm cheating. But it makes it a bit um, harder to be invisible behind the subject because you cannot hide behind the light itself. As, uh, as it's black, you, you see through um, well, you see everything through. So it's a bit more tricky to to be invisible. Um, but it's as simple as that. You want to explain how you uh, did that trick with the sand? Sure, while we're at it. As you can see, I'm just going to put it a bit bigger. As you can see, there's sand coming, uh, like doing long exposure trace uh, from both of my hands, but I'm not blurry. So that's a, that's a bit tricky to do. Um, it's a question of timing of, uh, I had sent in both of my hands and making it quickly fall right before Eric passes the light and then stop moving when he passes the light behind me. Um, I don't know if it's clear. <laughs> it's it's usually better when we demonstrate it, but let's say it was, yeah, it's a choreography of letting this send down and then quickly coming back and not moving. There must be a video of that somewhere on Instagram. Pardon me? There must be a video of that somewhere on Instagram, I think. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we have a YouTube yeah. video about that. Okay, what's next? Uh, I think, so your favorite image. Yeah, uh, let me try to find it. Oh yeah, you can do that. So it's in the, in the first series for me, so. So since we started our NFT journey, we made, um, we made series. Uh, it's a it's a collection that 
is called night reflection. Oh yeah. So that's the one for me because it's everything. Kim is looking super good. The, her pose, her dress, everything is, is, is perfect. Uh, my taste on that. And the balance we have between the brightness of the tube and the background, the location was just magical working over there. That is in uh, Bolivia, the salt, salt flats. And this is an image I envisioned for a year prior to go there. And this is exactly what I wanted to do. So I'm super happy with this one. It's been created in 2017. So it's one of my favorite. Um, it's hard. We have 12 chapters in the Night Reflection collection. And I think I have one favorite per collection, but we made, we made the, um, uh, I wanted to say the effort, but it's not an effort, but we made like the, the work of selecting our top six out of the 108 images that is in the night reflection collection. And that is, these are the ones that we picked. Yeah. Um, maybe you can. Uh... Yeah, this is one of my favorite for sure. Yeah. So there was something special about this one that I didn't even know it was possible, but Kim started to insist on this very uh, specific thing. Reading yeah. the subject with light painting, with long exposure, it's not supposed to be possible. Yeah, exactly. So it was so windy. Uh, this picture has been made and created in Death Valley. This is like, this feels like home. <laughs> we love that place. Um, it was very windy, and as we were saying, the the shape of light that Eric does, the faster it is, uh, the more precise it is. And since it was very windy, he moved fast enough to froze my hair in in the air. Um, and we've been arguing about that because I was saying that it was possible, and he was saying no. No, no. <laughs> so you know, long exposure. Everything, everything is moving. It's gonna get blurry. But no, we started to freeze a uh, few things. Uh... Exactly. And that actually, that was this, the sparkler idea for the sand um, falling down uh, from my hands. It's the same, the same idea of freezing things that are moving with our long exposure photography. Another example is in the sand going out of it. Yeah, we have some demos about that somewhere. Yeah. So we like to think of what we create as obviously we're doing long exposure photography, but the process almost feels like uh, kind of a performance because I'm staying still for a very long period of time. Eric, I'm always saying that he's dancing with the light, so it it feels like uh, a little moment of performance just for the two of us because we're usually alone. <laughs> Is there any more questions or comments or? So while we're working, oh, uh, we have a question. Um, do you change the color to match the sunset in post-processing or try to plan for that while shooting? Yeah, a tiny bit sometimes because like, I don't have enough tubes to cover all the, uh, the, spectrum. White, the yeah. white balance values because as you, as you know, like white balance is to get the, the real white and I don't have um, 12 different white balance values with my tube. So sometimes I'm going to adjust a, a tiny bit so the tube looks a bit whiter or a bit bluish. Sometimes I, I just like to have it uh, a bit more bluish. Um, but um, I have, I think, six, no, five. I have five tubes uh, that are kind of white uh, from bluish to yellowish. So I can start the night with the, the one that is more bluish at the white balance that is more yellowish, you know, to balance the, the colors. But once we start working with the orange, uh, it doesn't matter that much. It just fits super well with a cold white balance value. 
with the deep blue colors of the of the blue hour. But as soon as the blue hour is done, it's over. I cannot really work with the orange too. It's just not making sense. It's not it's not mm -hmm. beautiful. So then I move on to something a bit more uh, desaturated, like any of the whitish tubes that I have. Yeah, but it's true that depending on the color of the blue uh, of the sunset, uh, if we're shooting uh, on like uh, two words, the sunset it's going to be more colorful, and sometimes it's going to be more pinkish, sometimes it's going to be more orange. But if, and if we shoot on the opposite side, then usually it's like deep blue. Um, so yeah, Eric will choose uh, the color of the tube he will be using according to. Uh, the sky and also the landscape. Like, are we on orange rocks or white uh, white sands or snow? So it, it will have a, an influence on the, our choice because we want to kind of complement, um, like balance all the colors together. Yeah, but as you can say, I keep it very simple. It's always, most of the time, it's just white, orange, or in rare cases, uh, rainbowish, but... And sometimes I even turn off the the light of the tube itself. Uh, on this one, yeah, I'm just using the tube as a um, as an extension. So mm -hmm. I have a birthday sparkler on top of my tube. The flashlight is off, and the only light is the sparkler itself. Yeah. So by having the the flashlight off, it it makes almost the same as using the black tube that we showed earlier. So it's like the the light is only uh, being created by the sparkler, which in sir actually your question I think Rex, um, the long stringy looking light uh, is the birthday sparklers, and depending on what kind of sparkler we we use, it's going to create a different effect because they all have a specific chemistry. Some of them uh, it looks like a rain of fire. Some others are really small. Um, little pop of fire. Um, but all of those are things that are supposed to go on a cake. So we're trying to be uh, safe. <laughs> yeah. Um, this yeah, one is the <laughs> brightest one, the longest one that we ever tried. It's called Rainbow Sparkler. I think they got frozen. Can you hear me, Eric? Is it? Are you back? There we go. Are we back? What happened? I don't know. We got rugged. Oh, no. Well, it took a, an hour for us to get rugged. It's, it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, not too bad. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's a question. Are you? Yeah. You're offline. Okay, so we don't see the questions anymore, but we're online. It's a minimum. Okay. So. Boom. So is there any more question or things you'd like to share before we maybe wrap up?
still waiting for Discord to come back on Kim's computer where we had uh, the list of questions. And while we're waiting for this, um, I'm going to go through this series here that is uh, that has been created out of uh, constraints. So sometimes when nothing is working, when I don't have nice clouds, where I don't have a good composition, but if I have reflection, then I'm going to totally change the settings to get rid of the whole background. So on these, I was looking for a pitch black background. That was the end result I was looking for because the clouds were not good. So it, this series exists only because of some of the bad nights where it was just not interesting. Uh, it sometimes could be just very thick clouds and very flat, not interesting. So if we have, uh, if we're in the lake, then it gets super cool to just change the settings. We've got full power on the, on the flashlight. We've got settings like F13 uh, and low ISO. And then we can really focus on the light painting shape itself. It helps uh, to have affection. Those uh, would not look the same with other reflection, of course. Mm -hmm. But it's a good option where, where when there's when nothing is working, you <laughs> just get rid of the background. Yeah, exactly. So we we don't see the landscape, but we can still feel it because the water uh, as it is very different on each of those image because it's a different source of water. The the there's a different speed of wind that was present or not. And we can also use colors that we would not use otherwise because uh, because it would not be a right fit for the landscape, for instance. So it has other advantages. Thank okay. <laughs> okay, I think that's, that's it. We've been through uh, pretty much everything. Um, First slide, boom. There we go. Final words by Kim Henry. Oh, why do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, just thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting us. Uh, we're super happy to be sharing what we do with you. We hope, we actually really hope that we will see other people trying it out. We already know people in the audience that are doing light painting, um, but yeah, we we hope that it will inspire you to try other things. Yeah, it's a, it's a very fun and addictive technique. Once you start, it's hard to stop. Uh, as you can see, we're not uh, we're not like the best. Uh, we're not we're not meant to teach anything like this. We're not meant to teach photography. But as we figured out this technique and people got so interested, uh, it just became natural to to start making videos and get better at speaking in English, even if it's not natural. And so uh, I hope this. I hope it's clear that we're just sharing this technique so more people can can join this and and have fun playing outdoors because it's it's a really healthy and fun uh photography technique so i think that's it <laughs> well thank you eric thank you kim for putting time into this and for doing this for meta jungle uh we can tell that you guys are very passionate about what you do so uh we think it was um a great workshop overall so thank you again and we look forward to seeing Thanks. what you guys do next all right thank you talk to you thank soon you.